This is going to be a, a a winter that's going to be remarkable for the white changes to the bourbon that comes out. Why is that? How mild it is? Because it's yeah. so mild. We yeah. Never. We never hit the a real hard cold. It takes at least usually two weeks of, to fluctuate temperature of a warehouse. Mm-hmm. So you really need two weeks of below fifty degrees to get it to convert across one season to the next. So we're skipping right now. We're skipping a year. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting. Hey everyone, it's a brand new month and we are kicking off a new segment we are calling Back to Basics. Yes, we've gone on far too long about the secondary nonsense and behind the scenes information that we've neglected the very thing that brought us into this world, the bourbon itself. So get ready for the next few episodes where we get back to the basics and focus on the process, the art, the craft, and even the laws that make this spirit the enjoyable juice that we all have grown to love. This episode kicks things off by getting into 101 and 201 level knowledge. I can guarantee you're going to learn something about bourbon that you never knew before. That being said, remember that this is a listener-supported podcast, so your sponsorships go a long way in keeping this podcast alive. Please consider being a sponsor and donate as little as $1 a month at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash bourbon pursuit. Enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Burn Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan are here today in the studios here in Louisville, Kentucky. Yep. Yeah, our we're, famous studio. Our famous Your studio. kitchen table. <laughs> Dining room table. Let's get it right. No soundproofing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we're doing our best with what we have, but this is our kickoff to what we and Ryan had come up with as, as coined as Newbies Month. And I guess kind of give a, a, an introduction to you know what we're going to expect this month. Yeah, so we're trying to get back to basics, you know, in this bourbon game, you kind of get consumed by special releases, hunting, like always going for the rare and you kind of forget, you know, there's a lot of fun and enjoyment about the basics of bourbon. And we're trying to just get back to that for our listeners um, because it's, I've, I've personally gotten burned out on special releases and everything, so I'm excited to go back and dive deep into why we got here in the first place. I know, because I, I feel like we're almost losing you a little bit, because well, you're... I know. You're, I'm going off to rum, I'm like, <laughs> now I'm buying some wine, but no, I'm, 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 I'm staying here, you know? <laughs> you're not going to you're not gonna completely give out on No, this. no, I'm still going getting my Heaven Hill six year and, and all that, you know, just staying with the basics this year. Good, yeah, I, that's that's what I'm, I'm really... Um, I'm glad we're going to be able to do this because, like you said, I think I think we we contribute to a problem. But hopefully, this this kind of also really gets a, a lot of the, I guess you could say, the education down that we can have recorded. It's perpetual. It's out there, and um, you know you can listen to it as as much as you want. And you can share it along and make sure that if anybody wants to get into bourbon, be like you go and you listen to this episode, and there's your base for it. So. Exactly. So very happy to introduce our guest today. So today we have Tim Niddle. Tim is a bourbon educator at distillliving.com and a certified Stave and Thief Society executive bourbon steward. So Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I did say you're to be here. I said your last name correctly. You actually got it right without you even all those uh, asking right. before the show. Which I know. Is fantastic. I felt like I was going to make like a, 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 a cardinal sin of podcasting <laughs> is not asking how to say the last name before we started. But uh, you nailed it. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. So Tim, again, welcome to the show. Uh, and just to give him an idea so today is going to be really an introduction into bourbon this is going to be bourbon 101 bourbon 201 what really makes uh you know what we're here what we i guess gone crazy over all the bourbon nuts out there that are listening like make you understand why you're listening to this and i can guarantee you're going to learn something that you didn't know before so uh tim ready to be stumped yeah (laughs) (laughs) so before we dive into that let's let's set up the base here so tim kind of talk about uh who you are how you got into bourbon all this other kind of good stuff sure so so um, I've been in Kentucky most of my life, um, but I never got into bourbon in my drinking days, I'm like in the beginning. Um, I got into wine. I was managing a wine bar. I was going through that. Uh, after that closed, some buddies of mine uh, decided they wanted to get me into bourbon. So they sat me down. I ordered the sushi. They brought a bottle. They poured it for me. I took a sip, and I was like, whoa. I was like, it's hot. Sorry. Uh, and I, and I Good kind try. Of Good try. Yeah, so my introduction was, wasn't the best. Um, but then I was working for Weta Michael, who's a local celebrity chef down in central Kentucky in Lexington. And when she became the chef in residence at Woodford Reserve, I moved over there with her. So my real first introduction was under 
the tutelage of a James Beard nominated chef and the master distiller for Woodford Reserve. That's when I learned how to taste it. That's when I learned how to get into the deep flavors. That's when I learned about the product and I got really, really excited about it. Uh, so I spent several years there managing the culinary program. Eventually, uh, Brown Foreman created a job for me at the distillery doing brand education work and bourbon education work. Uh, it was a great deal of fun. And then a year ago, I created my own business and went independent. So now I get to talk about all brands and, and bourbon uh, generally. And you I do a lot of writing. You real opinions now? No, I get to give my real opinions. <laughs> my real opinion is still Woodford Reserve is excellent. Uh, <laughs> that hasn't changed any. Um, but I get to talk uh, favorably about everybody. Uh, not that I didn't talk favorably about everybody beforehand, but now I get to put everybody on an equal pedestal, which is great. Um, and I do writing for a bunch of different uh, outlets. Uh, do consulting for distilleries and bars, helping them get into bourbon and connect with bourbon consumers. So talk a little bit more about distilled living and, and what you do with your company. Yeah, so um, uh, first and foremost, I've been doing a lot of writing. What's surprising is to me was that that was such a big piece of industry desire right at the moment. Um, and there's a lot of people getting into bourbon more every day. Um, I feel like the bourbon enthusiast bubble is, is nowhere near breaking. It's just growing and growing. And people are getting into the category, but need basic education around it. Um, need to know who the big um, players are in the industry. You know, one of the, the biographies of people behind the scenes. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that. Um, and I I'm just uh, launched a four-part series for Artisan Spirit magazine. Um, helping distilleries reach those consumers. Um, but the rest of my time in Lexington is spent doing private bourbon education. Um, there is a, there's actually a big demand for it. So we have a lot of corporations that come in. They want to showcase Central Kentucky to the VIPs, the C-level guys that are coming in. Um, they want to do a bourbon tasting. And they need somebody to come and sit down with them and, and, and guide them through the process of learning about Kentucky's spirit and uh, learning how to taste the flavors behind it, understanding what it is. Um, I do bus rides uh, in between distilleries, so there's something to talk about. I help give background and provide more information than the distilleries are able to provide uh, during our limited time with them, so I can answer a lot of questions that people have uh, when, we're, when we're in the isolated setting of the bus as well. Uh, and that's, that's the, a big chunk of what I do. Do you do that for like the public transportation system? You get on there and you're like, next stop. <laughs> and we'll have a tarp. little, yeah, where's your ticket? Here's your sample. Uh, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> no, I wish I could. Uh, but I do a, a private, uh, a lot of private functions. Right, absolutely. So what about like private functions? If uh, if I was hosting something here at my house and I needed somebody to come in and uh, for like my, entertain my 10 or 15 guests that I'm going to have here, do you do something like that as well? Absolutely. Just like uh, wine sommeliers have done for a long time doing home wine dinners, I do home bourbon dinners. Can you win never do that he's a know-it-all <laughs> he was like i don't need an expert i don't do the cooking but i but I, there are a lot of people you know who are trying to get into bourbon um and a lot of locals you know who are that's been a big surprise for me i thought a lot of my work would be with people who were outside of kentucky um the tourists or or people coming in for conferences and things um but a lot of people who have grown up in this state and are used to drinking bourbon or aren't used to drinking bourbon and want to get into it because it's so hot now still don't have a handle on what it is so my bourbon 101 classes and my other uh, regular public ticketed classes at various venues around lexington a lot of those are focused on locals learning what bourbon is Okay. I had a question. It might be slightly off topic, but you're ta you said you were working with distilleries about mm -hmm. working with guests and stuff. Mm -hmm. And with some of the law changes, distilleries are now going to be able to like, serve more alcohol, let you sell more. And it seems like a lot of distilleries are building enhanced visitor experience. Like, Can you talk about like how... I guess they're trying to become more like Napa in the sense that it's... And it's not just go to the tour and that's it. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's been an enormous change in the industry over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So, I mean, we started in a place, people may not be able to remember, but we started in a place where it was primarily just Maker's Mark offering a really publicized visitor experience. Um, and even then, they couldn't sell their product back in the day. And over time, we've gained... Um, the ability to sell bottles out there to the distillery gift shops, ultimately have samples. Um, some places still don't have samples seven days a week. You know, Sundays are going to be off limits. Uh, but most places can do a little bit of a samples. Uh, last year, the law changed. Senate Bill 11 came in. Instead, we, we moved from one ounce of total sample to 1.75 ounces. So that's a pretty hefty amount of sampling that you can do. But it also said that you could effectively have a bar at a distillery. Now, there are some constraints around it compared to a regular bar, but 
it does create the all day type experience that you have Napa and Sonoma. And that's absolutely what it's been modeled after. Uh, the success uh, that those valleys have had in creating a tourism scene and making it very valuable for the wineries there uh, has been the inspiration for the way we've developed out bourbon tourism in Kentucky. Um, so being able to go to a distillery, do the tour that's 45 minutes or whatever, do a sample that takes another 15. Um, you maybe spend 20 minutes in the gift shop or you can sit on the porch, you can get a cocktail or you can get a larger neat pour. You can spend more time talking to the employees and the owners. Um, it's, and locals can come and hang out and get a drink, you know, after work. Um, it's completely changed the way people are thinking about the distillery's relationship to the community and to tourism. Uh, I think it's just been generally a great thing. Uh, I did an interview with the folks down at Barrel House about that particular topic a couple months back and that their, their new bar is opening very soon um, called Elkhorn and they're expecting their, their profitability increase um, and their cash flow increase to be able to double their operations. They're going to get another still, they're going to get more fermenters and moving everything around. So it's, it's great for them as an example moving forward. Yeah, super excited about that because when you go, it's like you said, you only spend like 20 minutes at the store and then you're like, oh, on to the next one. Now you can sit with your wife, maybe listen to a band, have a full bar, you know, enjoy it. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. Yeah, and it won't just be the bourbons that they sell. There'll be, you know, options for wine, for gin, yeah. for beer. So if, you, if you're doing a big group coming through Kentucky, not everyone has to be a super bourbon enthusiast or maybe you're, you've hit your palate limit for the day and you need something a little lighter uh, to carry you through until you've hit your restaurant destination for dinner. That's, that's great options. Exactly. So, so I guess that's a good segue. So let's go ahead and just jump into it. So let's, let's go ahead and start with the, the bourbon 101 knowledge. So I guess let's kind of jump into it. You know, what, what do you kind of start off with a class? Because if, if I'm going to come in and I'm a brand new to this, I say, well, what is bourbon? Yeah, well, I like to throw it back on the audience. So I, I like to open my classes and say, does anybody know what bourbon is? Can anybody tell me what it is? I and, do. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, bring it out for us. Uh, it's a 51% corn <laughs> mash bill. All right. Uh, has to be aged two years in a new white oak charred barrel. And that's... What are the Ten Commandments? It has to be <laughs> has to be made in America. Made in America. Oh, we got okay. the made in America one. We, that's, okay. that's unusual. That one doesn't hit often. We uh, we prefer it to be made in Kentucky uh, first and foremost. But, uh -huh. you know, that's a good <laughs> yeah. one. Not a law, but definitely a preference. Yeah. yeah. Um, All right. So we hit yeah. a couple of things there, and and that's usually how it goes. Uh, usually, even at, even at the bigger crowd, different people are going to throw out different things. Um, unfortunately, there were some myths in there. There's some inaccuracies. So we're going to walk through the whole thing. What I like to do is first position bourbon in the hierarchy of beverage alcohol, right? So that's, that's our foundation. Bourbon is a form of beverage alcohol. It's great. Everybody usually can, can it get you drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most people can establish that pretty quickly, pretty easily. And when you look at beverage alcohol, all drinkable alcohol that we have comes from yeast fermenting sugar. Well, we've never found a way to synthesize alcohol you know, in the lab in any way. So your sugar source defines your initial beverage category. So grapes make wine, you know, grains make beer. It's a great way of starting thinking about it. Now you can add to that production process another step and that's distillation. So you distill wine, you get brandy. Very easy, very simple. You distill beer and you stick it in an oak container and you get whiskey at its most basic. And there are different regional laws and there are different you know, international trade agreement laws and there's a lot of different things around it. But, but at its most basic, you ferment some grains, you run it through a still to separate the alcohol and some of the water from all the solids and, and the majority of the water. You stick it in oak, you get whiskey. So bourbon is a category of whiskey. Um, it's technically an adjective. We use it like a noun. You go into a bar, you order a bourbon, but bourbon whiskey, like we have scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey, Canadian whiskey, wheat whiskey, rye whiskey, light whiskey, corn whiskey. We have bourbon whiskey. That's why you always um, see it written that way on a bottle. So then we've positioned it that way. Then we look at the rules around bourbon and its production processes kind of go hand in hand and they're helpful to understand each other together. Um, 
I like to frame everything in the way Mike Veach talks about with his six sources of flavor. So he talks about water, grains, fermentation, distillation, maturation in the barrel, and then finally presentation, how you batch it, how you bottle it. Now, there's no rule around water. A lot of times people will say something like, oh, it has to come from limestone water. It doesn't. No, I've seen the reverse osmosis machines yes. <laughs> in all the distilleries. Exactly. <laughs> Once upon a time, everyone used limestone aquifer water here in Kentucky because it was pure. And as the purity level has dropped, we've uh, had to move to the reverse osmosis. But we start with water. Um, water can contribute negative flavor. That's why everybody reverse osmosis is their water. To do a real fun tasting, if you're here in Kentucky, um, get yourself some distilled water or reverse osmosis or highly purified water. Get yourself some old limestone water, which is, uh, I thought I, it's meant as to add a splash to bourbon. I thought it was kind of a joke at first until I tried it. And pour yourself some water out of the tap. Taste those three side by side and you can see Limestone water has an amazing, wonderful flavor. But if you don't, if it's not, you know, if you don't have wonderful, high quality limestone water, you drop back to your reverse osmosis, to your purified. But that's where you're going to start because you don't want to introduce any negative flavors into your bourbon. Is there anybody that's still doing limestone, or is that just kind mm -hmm. of like a like a fad of old times that was necessarily a thing? Or... Because I mean, to be honest, that's that's one thing that that I'm already kind of getting uh, busted on. As I was in my head, I was just like, oh yeah, Kentucky limestone water, like that's uh -huh. what makes you know Kentucky bourbon so great. Because I always heard the thing that said like, oh, and that's why Kentucky breeds better horses because there's more calcium in <laughs> limestone right. water. Like absolutely true. I mean, that's that's part of the story too. Um, what I know of right now is Woodford Reserve um, is using 100% aquifer water uh, at their distillery. Um, the, the law is if water breaks the surface, it has to be processed in some way. So they dug a well and actually broke into the aquifer underneath the property. So they're able to use that directly. Uh, when I was down there, I tried to get access to it, and they wouldn't let me have it. Because uh, I was like, oh, we should we should taste this. This is amazing. This is going to be wonderful. And they were like, well, sometimes it has sulfur in it. Sometimes it has other things. So um, it's great for the yeast. It's great for making the bourbon. It's not great for drinking. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, my grandma, she lives out in the middle of central Kentucky, and she has a well. And it's, mm -hmm. the ice is terrible. We have to bring, like, her own, <laughs> we have to bring her own ice because it tastes like shit. It's true. <laughs> that's, why, uh, that's why the old limestone uh, drinking water is so great because yeah. they, they've purified it just the right amount. They filtered out those things but left that mineral content, uh, and you really get to experience it. That's a good question. Um, so we use the water to cook the grains. Now, any whiskey uh, can use any set of grains. Usually it's malted barley, um, but um, for bourbon – as Ryan, you mentioned earlier, minimum 51% corn. You could have 100% corn bourbon if you wanted to, but this stuff is unwieldy. It's difficult to work with. It really provides the starch in the backbone that becomes the alcohol and not a lot of the flavor. But for our, from our rules perspective, minimum 51% corn within our 100% grain recipe. So who decided that? Why not 50%, 49% corn? Why were they saying it had to be the majority grain? When bourbon was being formalized um, in the TTB and being codified, they what they did was they looked at historical research uh, and they, they were trying to define an existing category already in the marketplace. And to differentiate it from rye, rye whiskey, they, they, they said majority grain corn versus majority grain rye. Gotcha. Um, that's why the one of the reasons those two... Um, products are so similar um except for the majority grain there's there are a couple of the distinctions we can get into those or not this is about bourbon but right um <laughs> but that's why it went to corn because corn had historically been used to make a product called bourbon already existing in the market w the rules came much later the, the production processes all came first uh, and it wasn't formalized until later on um, all right so now we take we ferment our grains and do a product called the distiller's beer really easy to follow um, and now we're going to send that on to distillation. So distillation is the process of separating alcohol, water molecules, and certain flavors and sending them forward in the production process and leaving behind everything we don't want. There's a lot of off flavors in fermentation, so we leave those. Um, now, working with any alcoholic beverages, if you distill your beverage above 190 proof or 95% alcohol by volume, what you have coming off the stills becomes odorless, colorless, tasteless, and that's how you make vodka. So that is that set of spirits. 
for any whiskey generally, you keep it below the vodka range, below, below 95% alcohol. Well, how, how do you do that, I guess? Because once you're distilling, like, like what's the, I mean, can you just add water to it at that point? Or is it, is there a, a certain... Um, There's a control valve or something. Yeah, that's a great know. question. Like, so yeah. it depends on if you're using a pot still or a column still. So in a pot still, when you started at the beginning of the process, um, you, you heat up the liquids and solids that are in the, the bowl of the still, and the vapors start to come out the top, starts to evaporate. Um, it's going to be 0% alcohol at the beginning. It's just the water right at first. And over time, your alcohol percentage raises, uh, and then you hit a kind of a peak where the, the most alcohol is coming out, and then it starts to fall. Um, and different pot stills get to different points. You know, a pot still can get above 160 proof. It can get to 170 proof, you know, during right the, 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 the highest point of the run um, and still not have your aggregate come out below, above 160. So you can still make bourbon that way. Um, I was down at um, Bluegrass Distillers and they were peaking right around 160 proof at the moment when we were talking about their still, when we were looking at it and, and tasting off of it. And their whole run comes in around 115, 120. Because at the beginning, prior to that peak, and then afterwards for a little while, they're going to be at a lower alcohol percentage coming off the still. With a column still, it's a little bit different. It's a little more complicated. Um, but in terms of the rate that you introduce your liquid into the still, the amount of steam, uh, the pressure, um, you're going to have your, your vapor come off at different levels. So, And then usually with any distillations, you, with any alcoholic beverage, your first distillation is low, and you need to run at least a second or a third. This is why vodkas have claims about how many hundreds of times they've been distilled. Quadruple distilled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, because you need to keep redistilling the same thing to get it to those really high percentages. So for bourbon, you know, single dis distillation is possible. Most people do double distillation to get it wherever they want it, anywhere from... Uh, 115 proof to 158 proof is typically your range that people go, but never above 160. Um, that's the law. Is that second time to be able to distill something much easier to do than the first time because of, you know, basically like everything's kind of already up there and yes. you kind of just, okay. So it's because a, of everything. Okay. Um, typically you don't have the solids in there after the first distillation. Most people, um, distill from from mash the first time um and so it's much easier the second time it's going to heat much more evenly and much less risk of scorching um it's going to run much faster because you're starting out with a concentrated liquid you, you're leaving behind um just the water and flavors that you want to leave behind which is going to be a smaller overall percentage so the whole thing runs faster and runs easier okay so there is a there is an economy of scale to this of why they do it and stuff like that because oh, yeah. it, it does get cheaper as you distill it more times well it doesn't the run gets cheaper. You're spending less energy on the run, and you're getting a higher proof product. So you're getting um, you're getting concentrated alcohol, which you're paying taxes on as a distiller. So you want to to get it as high as you are comfortable with um, to to maximize uh, the amount that you're going to have going into the barrel. Um, now, nothing of that is ever lost. It's just about how many times you have to run your still to get all of your fermented liquid into a distillation state. Okay. And most most are about a two two times for column most stills or two. And then I guess kind of, kind of, kind of like uh, speak a diagram, if you will. Like, how does that work? Does it go into a holding tank and then it kind of goes yep. again, does it? Or is it like That's going exactly through? exactly right. Okay. Yep. Uh, it goes into a receiver is usually what they call it. Um, it's usually behind a wall somewhere because it's not, you know, the big glorious still. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a receiving tank. Um, and then they'll have, uh, they call it different things. Um, it's after a, a, a stripping run. Um, they might call it um, first run spirits. Uh, they might call it low wine. That's a common industry term. Um, that'll be the, the, the result of that first distillation. Uh, and then the, the second time through usually is called new spirit. That's the most common term that people use. And that's what you see when people are, um, you know, drinking it off the still. Or Absolutely. You, white, you have, you have the, the pretty box with all the white dog going through. That's <laughs> yep. what you're seeing. That's you never really seeing. get to see that first run, like, no. go through those. And you really don't want to. I mean, that can contain corn oil, which at that point is going to be burnt. Um, potentially even a little bit of sulfur will pass through on that first still run. 
um, maybe even solids, uh, light, some of the lighter solids. You can stop there. That's... <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're nice. talking about bourbon. We're not talking about the stuff that we leave behind in the process. You don't like to chew your bourbon? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, now, very, very why pulpy. do people, I guess, I think I sort of know, but I guess with a column versus a pot still, why would they use one versus the other? Uh, the column I know it's real complicated, but maybe like a condensed down. All right. So it comes down to economies and efficiencies. Um, so a pot still is super inefficient, um, requires a lot of manual control, um, has to be observed, um, very subject to weather and ambient temperature, especially the greater, the larger your column still, the more surface area it has, the, the, the more it's going to be, uh, it's going to run hot in the summer and cold in the winter. I mean, that's just, that's how pot, pot stills work. Um, but they're cheaper to buy. They're cheaper to maintain and um, they're cheaper to run because you can start one whenever you've got your six or eight hours that you have of time to run the thing. Uh, and then when you're done, you're done. A column still, uh, because it's a continuous process rather than the batch process of a pot still, a column still really needs to be a high volume operation. That's, that's gonna, your big boys are going to be the ones who are going to invest in that. And typically, they, if you have a column still, you start it up um, Monday morning and you run it 24-7 until Sunday night and then third shift Sunday cleans it uh, and then you start it again Monday morning. You want to give it a continuous high volume supply of fermented mash into the column still because um, you don't ever want it to stop having liquid because you have to shut it down and start it again. Um, and you need to have a continuous supply of steam. But your efficiency and your quality consistency of quality is much easier on a column still gotcha uh, they do produce different flavor profiles um the column still um usually winds up stripping more out of it than a pot still uh especially your, your real small pot stills so you, you get varying um flavor profiles and intensities based on which one you're using so is there um i guess you could say a, a big bias to people say like oh a column still is not as flavorful or front forward as a pot still, or is that just kind of like a, I don't know, like, as you said, it's more about a, a, an efficiency mechanism more or less than it is a lot of the taste Sounds that goes like into it. Column still is more consistent or they're able to control it more. Yeah. Column still is definitely easier to make consistent. It's not that you can't make a pot still consistent, but it's going to be a lot harder. Um, it's, there's, you know, bourbon has its <laughs> share of snobbery uh, around it, especially, yeah. Uh, and so there, you know, there are people who are like, oh, I don't ever, you know, I don't like column still stuff. It strips too much. But you can run a column more gently. It's possible to get more flavor out of it, keep it a little bit lower. Um, on the other hand, there is something to be said for stripping it really, really uh, intensely and getting most of your flavor from the barrel. Um, there's a lot of uh, a quality that can come out of that way. So it just depends on what the distiller wants. There's no right or wrong answer with it either way. All right, cool. Let's move on. I think right. we, be, we, be, we beat the still thing to death. All right, so now it's distilled. All right, we talked at the beginning of the show about uh, new charred oak barrel. Big, big piece of bourbon. Most people who are into bourbon a little bit know that piece. Um, now, the law says oak container. It doesn't specify barrel. Um, barrel is the convention um, the, for the container and its size, usually around 53 gallons. Um, it ha has to be made of oak. That is specified in the law. It's almost redundant. I mean, we are seeing people experiment nowadays with alternate woods, but you've got to use oak because oak is really the only wood that holds liquid. Once you make it into a barrel, if you're using most other woods, you're not going to have a barrel, you're going to have a sieve. So if you want to drink anything afterwards, <laughs> um, it's got to be the oak. Uh, new means it's never been used to hold anything. Unlike uh, any other whiskey, any other product in the world, uh, bourbon has to be new and it has to be charred. So charring is where they set the barrel on fire on the inside, let it burn for a little while. That process exposes the flavors that are in the wood and allows them to become soluble into the liquid that you put into the wood. If you, don't, if you skip the charring step and you have raw green wood, you put liquid into it, it'll never develop any additional flavor. It won't develop its amber color. Uh, it's just gonna be kind of bland. Now is a wine barrel like that they don't, I guess, since they don't char it? Uh, wine barrels are still heat processed. They're still toasted in some way. 
Um, it's the difference between toasting and charring is toasting is going to be a radiant heat at a lower temperature, usually around 400 to 600 degrees, although people do different things. Um, it's kind of like taking the element out of your oven and sticking it inside the barrel, cranking it up to maximum. Um, that still has to be done to break down the tannins and the lignans and the other flavors that are in there. Charring is kind of a, a fast process. Um, provides heat at about 15 to 1800 degrees um, and it provides combustion onto those oak sugars so we get more caramels butterscotches burnt sugar flavors it also exposes more vanillins so we get more vanilla flavor by burning it by charring it um, rather than the toasting it like the wine barrels do so typically when we, we talk about the oak that goes into barrels, um, it's usually white oak, right? Mm -hmm. Because red oak, if we can go into pretty much any home, uh, people have hardwood floors, that's typically made out of red oak. Mm -hmm. uh, oak is a very strong wood, but you know, red oak isn't typically used in barrels. Right. Why is that? Yeah, uh, there's nothing in the law that specifies white oak. But white oak holds liquid well. Red oak can be made into a barrel might hold liquid, might not. It's very technically difficult to work with because its cellular structure is different. Um, it doesn't have the same water retention, liquid retention capabilities that white oak has naturally. Um, so we just use white oak because it works. I mean, it's easy. There just simply isn't another wood that is the same as white oak. Okay, so I, I guess, and then you kind of mentioned something a little bit ago about having like French oak. Like, so is there, is I mean, I know there's a bunch of variations of oak and oh, yeah. there is experimentations, but I mean, I know oak is pretty much the predominant one. Have you heard of anything else that is an oak that has held up to the test of time or been able to be able to give the same characteristics or whatever it is? No, there's just nothing that's the same. Every other wood that's ever been tried to use for beverage alcohol has been experimentations and limited releases. I mean, they occasionally, you know, Woodford Reserve did a maple wood barrel finished version of their product um and but it's you know they would never release a a primary product where, where the first barrel and the only barrel was maple wood it's it's always going to be white oak as your base so i guess going into the the barrel portion right i mean you said an oak container mm -hmm. and you know now that i'm i'm even going to ask the question i think i'm already going to dispel it is like you know when you think about the way that you store these these barrels and these rick houses it would almost make more sense to put them in boxes in regards yes. to being able to have spatial uh pieces but then i think like the well boxes don't roll boxes, <laughs> boxes, boxes don't, don't roll, roll. It's, hey, well but, but <laughs> do we need them to roll we have machines we could put them on forklifts we could put them on pallets we could move them around um, the difficulty is you, it would be nearly impossible to make a wood box, an oak box that holds liquid without nails without or something nails. or glue. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's the shape of the barrel makes it seal. Um, so it's a perfect container. I mean, it was developed, you know, more than 2000 years ago to hold liquid, to be able to transport it long distances. It works well. We've never found anything better. So a lot of people think that the oak does everything like it right. doesn't matter all beforehand it's what what you put in and let let the oak do its magic so how important is to you you think uh well the, you know different people say different things uh i think 60 to 80 percent of the flavor comes from the oak um from th from the where it's sourced how the barrel is made how it's handled during maturation the climate the number of years all those factors those are your 60 to 80 percent um but it's it's possible to dispel that right now you go into a big liquor store you find a couple of different, you know, white dog products um, and just taste them side by side. There, you'll be able to tell the difference right away in the initial distillates from different distilleries. Uh, it's really easy to, to pick them apart. Yeah, and to, and to say, yeah, there is different flavors from previous places in the process. Okay, so let's let's kind of talk. Let's move on a little bit more. So, like, what's the what's the next step in, in this right. journey? Well, getting it into the barrel is a step. So, there's another rule here, uh, unique to bourbon. So, your distillate can come off the still at up to 160 proof, but it must be cut using nothing but pure water to 125 proof maximum, or 62.5 percent alcohol, before you put it in that barrel. Um, there's a lot of chemistry behind that. We're not going to go into the deep chemistry stuff here, but, uh, but different um, solubility ratios depending upon your, your alcohol to water ratio and different things. But we've got to keep it below 125 proof when it goes into the barrel. you got to pay Tim to come to your house to be able to yes. explain that part. Yes, right. sure. Happy to. Happy to. <laughs> All right. Um, now, 
I think at the I think at the beginning we talked something about a two years. I can't remember if somebody said two I said years. two, two years. years. All right, there is nothing in the law on a minimum age for bourbon. As soon as it hits, it must be the ball and bond act. Shit, <laughs> that's the model and bond act. That's part of it. It's also straight. Um, so, um, the uh, the when the liquid the distillate hits the new charred oak container, it is bourbon. Mm-hmm. You can bottle it up. You know, Jimmy Russell has a great quote where he says, you can take an oak bucket, char it, fill it up off your still, walk it over to the bottling line, bottle it up, and call it bourbon. You just can't reuse the bucket. (laughs) And that's how it works. And um, so when you're maturing bourbon, there are ages that matter. And that's where people get confused around these rules and things. So at two years, you can apply the adjective straight. Now, straight means a spirit, a whiskey, has been in a new charred oak barrel at least two years, has no additives for color or flavor, and is the product of a single state. Um, So you see that almost every bourbon label that you look at says Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. That's because they've been aged at least two years and hit that mark. Um, Anything less than four years of maturity has to declare an age statement on the label. So most of your bourbons are going to be greater than four years old. That's that's your your maturity mark. Anything less than four years is generally considered an immature bourbon. That's why it would have to carry an age statement. You can kind of think of it as the reverse of scotch. Scotch is the longer they're in barrels, the more proud they become of their age statement. So you see, uh, you know, if it's been in there eh, 10, 12 years, it may or may not carry an age statement. But at 18, at you know, 25 years, they're definitely going to. Bourbon is backwards. You know, once we hit four years, um, most places are pulling the age statements off of it. And it's up to the discretion of the distiller whether or not they want to put an age statement beyond that point. Now, can they mix in? Now, say they have four-year barrel or four-year bourbon in there. Can they mix in two-year with that and still call it a four-year nope. bourbon? The the youngest drop is the age of the product. Okay. So, so uh, as soon as you put a two-year-old product in there, even if it's 10, 20 years for the rest of it, that's a two-year-old bourbon. Gotcha. Um, and, uh, so then there's a a set of rules that overlap with the straight rules. So bourbon, and this is totally unique to bourbon. No other spirit, no other beverage alcohol has this rule. No additives for color or flavor. It's guaranteed all natural product. Now that overlaps with straight. So a straight rye is going to have those same, that same set of rules. Um, but otherwise it's unique to bourbon. Um, and then the final rule, and this is true for all whiskeys, is it must be bottled at not less than 40% alcohol or 80 proof. Um, and then the other one you mentioned already was uh, it must be a product of the United States. Right. <laughs> so I want to kind of go back to the, um, I, uh, I guess you can say the, the 80 proof, 40%. Now, there was a time when um, there was a thing called like light whiskey. Light that, whiskey. That, that distillers were coming out with to, because there wasn't a, a fad and the, the barrel proof you know, craziness <laughs> that goes on now, but there was a time when, uh, I don't, I don't even know what the percentage was, but it was, mm-hmm. it was fairly low. So those weren't technically bourbons, but those were just still whiskeys at the time. Right. And even those were not recognized in the international community as whiskeys, um, because internationally, except in, uh, Australia and New Zealand, you've got to have a minimum 80 proof to call it whiskey. Um, but for a period of time, the U S said, you know what, light whiskey, we'll, we'll, we'll release it for that category. We're kind of weird around our rules in the U S around everything. Um, we're the only place that allows uh, a whiskey called corn whiskey to not be matured. In fact, the rule for corn whiskey is, um, it has to be at least 80% corn and either not matured in a barrel or matured in a used barrel. Uh, I think they call it used cooperage in the law. Um, so yeah, so there's all sorts of crazy, um, near bourbon rules and near bourbon products. So I, I kind of want to touch on that last one about, you know, being made in America, but there's really nothing that's stopping anybody in Austria, New Zealand or uh, Russia or wherever from actually creating bourbon, right? Oh, they there just, is. There, there absolutely is? is. Yeah. Our international trade agreements um, forbid it. Um, the Kentucky Distillers Association really monitors that pretty heavily. And um, well, what if they, what if they do all the same process, but they just ah, don't put the word bourbon on it? Then they have made a bourbon style whiskey. Okay. And they're 
they can't necessarily put that on the label, but they can explain that to consumers, that they have met the whiskey rules except for that one about making it in the USA. So let's go back and touch on aging just a little bit. You know, what's the, what would you say is the average that you would see in the market today? Um, is there a, you know, there's, there's always this, um, I guess we'll start the first question is the average. And then mm-hmm. the second is there's always people that say when they taste, they're like, oh, it's so over oaked. Oh, yeah. Is, is that a, is that a, is yeah, that a like real the, thing? Is that a real what's thing? What's the happy spot? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's. You know, if you'd asked me that question 15 years ago, it'd be a lot easier to answer. Um, but nowadays, you know, we're seeing folks like uh, Hartfield and Company, they use uh, 5.8 gallon barrels. So their bar- their whiskey reaches a dark color in about four months and reaches the flavor profile they want very quickly. So that's, that's an incredibly young bourbon. Um, and then we're seeing, you know, most of your big distilleries and most of your, your, your craft distilleries that can last that long want to get to the four year mark. That's, that's just where maturity is for the, when you're using the 53 gallon barrels. Um, a lot of, everybody wants to put straight on there. It's a big deal. You know, there's a, if you go to the, the bluegrass distillers website, they got a countdown timer for when they go straight, when they got their first <laughs> two year product, um, from the big distilleries, really, the, they don't typically hit their stride until at least five or six years. I mean, that's just where most people are. Um, I think the sweet spot for me, just, just with my palate and other people are going to disagree with me and that's fine. I think the sweet spot is somewhere around seven to, to nine, 10 years. I just think that's where we get the most complexity of flavor. Um, and it doesn't hit. It's not said, 23. What? See, I know, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not an older is better person. Uh, I just, no, I'm not. Um, it's the over oaking thing. So there's a lot of chemistry that goes on inside barrel maturation. We don't even know all of it. Uh, we don't even understand all of it. Um, but the the wood itself is broken down by the water and by the alcohol, and it extracts flavors and extracts good flavors and bad flavors. Uh, evaporation occurs. Airspace gets into the barrels. You get oxygen in there. Oxygen starts to break things down. Um, produces a whole host of other flavors. Um, over time in the barrel, there, there are two things that kind of rise, I think, negatively past a certain point. And that is your, your real intense fruitiness, almost to an overripe fruit. Uh, that's a, a flavor characteristic that can develop as the oxygen is just breaking down everything that's in there. Um, you know, when you think about you know, if you, if you leave fruit out too long and it starts to rot, you can smell it from across the house. Um, that's because it's, it's releasing really short chain molecules. And the same thing can happen inside a barrel. And the over oaking thing is as the liquid gets deeper into the wood and the wood breaks down more and more, you can pull these hard tannins um, and just harsh, almost like over brewed black tea flavor notes out of it. Um, it can kind of wind up tasting like sawdust at a certain point. <laughs> um, there, there is a, there are sweet spots for bourbon, um, but everybody has their own taste. Some people, you know, they're, they swear by Pappy 23 and that's fine. You know, happy to have them in the market too. <laughs> yeah. Good luck to them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's so, that. So I guess another question back to the barrel. So, you know, 53 gallon barrel is pretty much the a standard right yeah absolutely um, now what would what would make as you said a uh, hartsfield company uh, mm-hmm. what, what would make somebody want to go and you know experiment with smaller barrels because you know we've actually had you know a few craft on and they said they even tried experimenting with smaller barrels and they just they just didn't they didn't mm-hmm. find it really developed what they wanted is there even more chemistry that goes on to what's happening inside of a smaller barrel versus inside of a large barrel when you have um, you know, more surface area, but less product or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it changes your ratio of your chemistries. So you think about your first layer of, of, of chemistry is extraction from the barrel. Um, the greater surface area you have, the faster your extraction um, as a vo- function of the volume of your liquid. Um, you know, the second piece would be evaporation. You, you're actually going to get faster evaporation, um, so you're going to get more headspace, and you get to your third set, which is the oxygenation and the oxygen breaking things down. The oxygen's breaking down the barrel and the liquid, um, different components that are in there. And that's a really critical step, and that's where people who who turn away from the small barrels, that's really what they're looking at, is, is they're not getting the oxygen into the barrels, they're not giving it the time to break down some of the harsh molecules produce um, fruity characteristics that are very pleasant over time, um, help with um, creating the right vanilla notes. Um, the, the time piece um, is separate from the extraction piece. 
In fact, if you look at a bourbon that's been in a 53-gallon barrel at two years and at three years, it's not a huge color change difference. Um, by two years in, it's extracted a lot of color because that happens very quickly. But it won't have developed the nuanced character that most of the distillers are looking for in that period of time. You know, one thing we didn't really hit on that we would be doing ourselves a disservice for the beginners is you got to talk about evaporation, what it's called, why oh, it happens. Oh, yeah. I mean, we skipped right over that piece, yeah, didn't we? All right. Yeah, and I was going to, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is for me? Okay. So the evaporation. So you go down to the distillery, and you're going to hear this every single time. This is the tour guide's favorite part. You walk into the warehouse. They open up the doors for you. You step across the threshold, and there's this beautiful aroma of the alcohol, the, the bourbon evaporating out. And they always say, does anybody know what that's called? And nobody <laughs> puts their hand up, even if they've been on a tour six or seven times. <laughs> uh, so they let the tour guide have their moment. The tour guide said, that's called the angel's share. We give the angels their share. We lose part of our product. Uh, but hopefully then the angels will come and look over our warehouses and make our product, make sure our product stays safe. Uh, so it's, it's a term borrowed from the scotch industry. They developed it. Um, but it's an important part of bourbon. You lose part of your product year over year. It's a very unusual industry in that we have that concern. And the location is very important too. The oh, yeah. Barrels, because we were talking earlier about, you know, you just got a 26-year-old Willet. And I was lucky enough to taste it. And I was like... It's like, man, this tastes like a 12-year-old bourbon. Mm -hmm. It doesn't taste... And Drew was like, well, it's been sitting on our low warehouse in the corner yeah. with no sun for 26 years. So that's why. That's why. It's, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, your temperature, your, your fluctuations in temperature, your extremes of heat uh, play a big role in that. Those older bourbons that still taste good, they've been handled very special. You know, you know, somebody, exactly like your example, that somebody's been monitoring them in a very unusual place. It's the only way that it works. Um, if you look at your typical five, six, seven-story warehouse... At the bottom, where it's very cool, um, comparably, your bourbons take longer to reach maturity, but you can get them to go longer and get some, some really interesting and complex flavors with, out of them over time. The ones at the top, extreme Kentucky summer heat, and you magnify that by the chimney effect of these warehouses trapping all that heat up at the top, uh, they're, they're not going to last as long. Uh, the barrels, the wood just takes damage from that heat. Um, you get faster extraction, you get, you get faster, faster oxidation, but you don't necessarily get as much nuance over time. Uh, and people explore those in different ways. You know, very, you know, makers famously, they want consistency. They don't care. So they move their barrels around. <laughs> Horribly inefficient. But they want to eliminate they that. They should look factor. into the boxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turn into like an Amazon, you know, facility. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have the robots start moving them. <laughs> yeah. So I guess um, when we talk about the aging and the rickhouses in general, is there anything unique about the rickhouses that, that make them uh, necessarily for you know, actually holding barrels, aging yes. bourbon versus just like, I don't know, I'll just go buy a tough shed and, you know, <laughs> age something in it. Like what would, what would be the difference? Or like, what am I, what am I getting out of having a especially built Rick house? Yeah, there's, um, well, you know, volume is one thing. I mean, when you're trying to get, uh, you know, 50,000 barrels in one building, you kind of need to do it custom. But beyond that, um, they are, designed almost all of them with a ricking system um, and this is the, the beautiful photos that you see and you see when somebody walks into one of these warehouses and immediately they've got to take a picture to go up on instagram um, of, the, of the long rows of the facing barrels and the, the barrel heads with the logos on them and um, the space between the ricks this system was designed to encourage airflow between the barrels so you so regardless of the exterior structure, which is less important unless you're heat cycling your warehouse, um, you know it's just it's basically there to keep the wind and rain off of the the shell is the interior is designed to make sure you have good airflow around the barrels and so all the barrels are accessible. Um, you need to be check on your barrels regularly. You got to have somebody go in there, look at all of them, or at least look at a pretty good representative sample. Make sure that you know you're not having leaks. Um, make sure that, that they're maturing properly. Be able to get to them to sample them. Um, people don't realize how often barrels are accessed to get samples over their lifetimes. It's not like you know if you know you, you're going to produce a eight year old product that at eight years you just go grab all your barrels. They need to be monitored as they're getting there, and even because an eight year old product that's your minimum. Um, you might throw some nines and tens in there because they didn't quite reach the flavor profile that you were looking for at the time. So a ricking system and the warehouses are designed to provide efficiency to 
the process and the chemistry that's happening and to provide a capacity for the employees to get to the barrels. Now, it's still a pain in the butt to remove a barrel. Uh, these things are really heavy, uh, you know, full about 550 pounds. So even if, if it's evaporated half of that, it's still going to be 250, 275. And, you know, there's no shortcut. If, if you need to get a, a barrel out of the middle of the rick house, you got to move every other barrel that's in front of it pull it out, you're probably going to immediately pop a new barrel into its place and then roll them back in. That's why you go into the warehouses and you look at the ages and the lot numbers that are on the barrels. Um, they're going to be all over the place because the, even though they may have gone in when the barrel warehouse was first filled, you know, in sequential order, all in the same dates initially, they came ready at different times and they got the blank spaces got filled in while they were accessible, uh, while all the other barrels were moved out of the way uh, with whatever was was ready that day. So that's why you see the spectrum of ages in every single warehouse. So it's it's highly inefficient. <laughs> highly inefficient. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, I was like, because you would think that, I mean, you, you look at most people that they have like a Coke dispenser inside of their refrigerator, right? You put the new ones on top and yep. then at the very bottom, you, you pull it out and then it just kind of like filters out and you get the next one, right? Yeah, very often uh, on the back side of the barrels where the consumers can't see it, there's a barcode um, because there are <laughs> massive databases um, for keeping track of every single barrel in every single warehouse. Um, it's, it's a huge job. Though. There are a lot of people who are employed just to track all the barrels that are aging in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And then some algorithm that says like, all right, these are the 60 barrels we needed to go and taste today. If, if it could be made into an algorithm, they would have done it. It's, it's yeah. literally just monitoring and watching and saying, what's the next ones to test? And what ones have we, that we decided weren't ready yet? Do we want to go back and revisit? Um, yeah. And it's, it's every barrel handled individually. Yeah. I got the, I got the lucky opportunity a couple of weeks ago into one of Willett's warehouses. And he's like, let me show you these barrels. And he's like, oh, it might be over here. Uh, no, it might uh -huh. be over here. Oh, there it is. That's the one. And then we drill into it. And he's like, oh, yeah, this one's good. But it still needs about six more years. And you're like, really? I think you should bottle it now. <laughs> <laughs> you want your will it now, yeah. But, yeah, it's like you said, those things, those structures are incredible because you're walking on these wood planks. And I'm mm -hmm. like, God, I hope it's, I feel like I'm going to fall through the floor. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the flooring, you know, for the consumer facing warehouses, it's, it's all nice and it's, there's railings, but in the real rick houses, it's, it's narrow passageways and it's dark and they're, uh, it's, it's an inefficient it's like process. A horror, it's like a horror movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be, it could be. All right, cool. So I think we uh, we hit a lot on the bourbon 101 and 201. We got a lot of in-depth pieces onto the you know, the aging, the making, the barreling. Uh, I think we, we hit on pretty much all portions of it. Great. So I want to talk a little bit, uh, you know, I know we're getting to the top here, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the tasting, right? Yeah. Because so, I mean, I guess, part. I guess this is, the, right. we talked about all the making of it, but I guess the tasting is is really where it all happens, right? Where, and, and, in, and there's a lot to it. I mean, I my first tasting experience, as I talked about, was not a place pleasant one with bourbon. And it wasn't until I was sitting there with Chris Morris and he was like, let me show you. Uh, and that was, that was eye opening for me. So one of the things that's really important to me when I'm leading a tasting is I cover the glasses before I start, before anybody sits down. Nobody gets to it until I let them because people are going to dive in. They're going to do it wrong. It's going to burn. They're going to mess up their nose. They're going to lose the, the beauty that went into the craft and the experience of these products. So what I always start with, get quality glass if you can. I love a Glencairn. That's my personal, but there are a lot of good quality glasses. Um, if you've got to use a plastic cup, so be it, but uh, there are other options. Um, <laughs> give your bourbon a little swirl. That breaks the surface tension and starts to release some of the aromatics. And then don't nose it. It's hard. you got to resist this beautiful bourbon sitting there. See, I jump into the nosing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and once you get used to it, you can. But but for people who are, who are really getting into bourbon or initially or if you are a bourbon enthusiast and you love it and you've been drinking it for 10 years or 20 years and you want to introduce somebody to it remember they're going to have a barrier to entry it's not going to be easy for them to pick up the glass and get the same thing that you get so after you swirl it you let it rest you let it evaporate off some of that alcohol bloom and then the way i know is there's two different techniques um, either breathe in through the mouth and out through the nose which is a little awkward breathing technique, but works extremely well. What that does is that pulls all of the vapors into your mouth and then traps the alcohol and then the aromatics go across your nose so you don't burn your olfactory sense. The other technique is to breathe in through your nose, but you start with your glass at your chin, 
which looks very awkward, but totally works. And then you breathe in gently through your nose and raise the glass from your chin to your nose. Um, I always demonstrate it first because it looks funny. And I want people to say, no, Sounds like a this meditation is, is technique. <laughs> oh, it might as well be. I mean, you're meditating on the quality of this bourbon right yeah. there. Um, and then you'll stop breathing in through your nose if you start to detect any burn. So that really helps people get past that. And a lot of people who come from wine, wine, you stick your nose in the glass, you breathe in, you know, 12% alcohol, it's not going to hurt you. Um, but bourbon, especially these high proof things, um, you know, the barrel strength stuff that can have so much alcohol coming off it. You can just burn out your olfactory sense and you got to wait 20 minutes to, to, to detect anything. So I always recommend nose gently to get started. Um, and when you taste bourbon for the first time, either the day or the first time in your life, it's going to be hot. Every bourbon is hot. No matter how smooth it is, no matter what the marketing talks about, no matter what your friends say about how amazingly smooth this bourbon is, no, it's going to be hot. Um, at least 40% alcohol. And, and most of your, your quality ones are, are a higher proof. Um, bottle and bond, you know, you hit that. That's got to be 100 proof exactly. I mean, there's a reason for that. Um, so what I recommend is first sip, hold it in the mouth 10, 15 seconds, do the Kentucky Chew with it swallow it and i always remind my audience first sips hot and we don't talk about flavor you know, somebody's gonna cough yeah it's fine let it go have a sip of water we're giving our palate time to adjust to the high proof nature all that alcohol then we're going to take a second sip and now we're going to look at some of the initial flavors and this is where people's eyes like start to light up a little bit where they're like oh wait there is flavor here there's something other than alcohol. And then after a minute, we do the third sip. And that's where we get into the nuanced flavors. And that's called the triple sip technique. And that's the way a lot of professionals do it and a lot of judges do it. In fact, certain judges uh, that I know within the whiskey community start their palates on vodka um, just to get them adjusted to high proof before they go into judging the whiskeys. Or just to remind them how much better bourbon is. There's that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is flavor. Oh, I get this. Yeah. Um, and then there's you can go deep into it beyond there. There's different ways of constructing flights to learn more. Um, there's different ways of using culinary aids to set people's palates with different flavors. So, you know, chocolate and bourbon is a great combination. A little dark chocolate is going to help you pull off the chocolate notes in bourbon. Yeah, so I guess with that is like, is there a lot of things that you would pair for a tasting that you would you would recommend? Um, like, was it maybe a types of cheese or oh, peanuts sure. or is a, yeah, Cheetos, yes. a bunch of cheeses? <laughs> um, well, I like to use uh, the flavor wheel tasting developed by Weed and Michael. Um, this was developed for Woodford Reserve, um, and it works best for that. But there are variants that, that work for different uh, other bourbons, and it's a great um, platform to begin thinking about. Um, cheese works beautifully. Now, I always get uh, an, a slightly older cheese. Um, the initial uh, flavor wheel plate was developed with a two-year-old Parmesan, um, which is, is a little drier, uh, a little concentrated fats, concentrated salts. And that helps set up the palate by... Um, uh, the, the fat sits on the tongue and keeps some of the alcohol off, makes it a little easier and a little gentler. And you, you, it's good to start a tasting with something fairly salty. It causes salivation, increases the oxygen to the tongue. Um, it really makes your, your whole sense of taste heightened. Um, and then we would move on to... So uh, it's not just for your spaghetti anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's for bourbon. Um, and we move on to uh, toasted nuts, which brings out the, the nutty barrel characters that are in there. Um, fruit obviously has a place. And, and fruit, you can go deep with fruit uh, and bourbon. Um, usually cherry notes are the ones that people get pretty easily in bourbon. Um, so I like to incorporate a dried cherry. Um, but there's nothing wrong with banana because there's all, a lot of bourbons have a strong banana character. In fact, that's the aroma that most people remember from a bourbon distillery is the banana note in the air. Um, so I like to incorporate that one. And then citrus is a natural. Um, you can do, you know, orange, lemon, lime, grapefruit. Um, and each of those will bring out different flavors in the bourbon. This is why whiskey sours are so popular. Uh, it's because those are flavor sets that match. Uh, and then chocolate's just your natural clothes. So how did you train your palate to be able to, uh, you know, pick out certain senses when you're nosing or anything like that? For anybody that's wondering, like, how do I really, uh, I want to I wanna better myself in regards of, you know, not just smelling it, because that's typically what I do. I go, oh, it smells like bourbon. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I've drank a lot, but I still haven't <laughs> gotten the, you know, all these nuances and stuff. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually a lot of work. It's a lot of sitting there and learning flavors. Um, so I try to cook a lot and I try to just 
refresh my palate memory on different flavors as I go along. Um, and then um, as an executive bourbon steward, I got a sensory kit. So it has a bunch of different flavor or, or excuse me, aroma uh, isolates in it. So if I need to think of, you know, what is a banana and I don't have one handy, I can go to that and use that to refresh my palate memory. Um, and it's getting a kit or it's, it's, um, it's putting bourbon with food. You know, if you're having dinner, just have a bourbon and, and look at your, look at what's on the plate and, and think about, are these tasting notes that I might've found in a bourbon, you know? Um, and if you're having, you know, get to the dessert, you get like tiramisu, you know, there's beautiful, um, um, chocolates and creams turn a lot of bourbons You know, like take a bite, take a sip of the bourbon, go back and forth, see what comes out for you. Uh, it's just, it's just practice. Um, inside the big distilleries, there are very long, very involved palate training programs, um, just like you have in culinary centers. Um, there is there are blind tastings. Um, there are fault identifications. There are, um, you know, they. Uh, as Elizabeth uh, McCall was on here uh, recently and talking about the, uh, the the triangle tasting, where two are the same and one is different. Can you find it? You can set those up for yourself, your buddies. Have people over, do a blind tasting. Say, you know, A B C. Figure out which one is different, and just practice with your palate paying attention to it learning that's there's no shortcut um that's the process all right awesome well with that i think there's one last question i kind of want to throw at you it might be a curveball oh so so people like like ryan and i where we you know we think we know everything but i'm sure we've even learned a lot more today what what do you think is something that most people who think they're I don't want to say bourbon aficionados, well educated, bourbon <laughs> snobs, whatever it is that that they necessarily um, have either a misperception about or don't know about in regards of either bourbon process, production, tasting, whatever it is. Um, I think very often they forget how much work it is to make bourbon. It is it is crazy difficult jobs out there. Um, I was fortunate to train in production for a little bit at Woodford Reserve, and it's it is amazing to me what those guys do day in and day out um, at every level of the production process. You know, sourcing the grains, checking on the fermentations, managing the yeast, um, running the stills. You know, checking the stills so often, managing you know, rolling barrels around. Um, and then all of the sensory that goes into it, I, you know, when somebody puts out a bourbon, any distiller anywhere, you know, they're, they're proud of their product. They've put so much into that, into creating a flavor profile that people are going to enjoy. And I just, you know, when I've got a glass, I try to remember that. I try to remember all the people who put effort and time and love and care into this product. And Damn, now I feel like shit. <laughs> the ones I said, this sucks. <laughs> this sucks crap. Hey, sometimes you got to be honest about it too. Um, and the other thing is, I think that as you get deeper into the bourbon community, it's easy to forget people outside the community won't have your appreciation for bourbon built in. And if you're introducing them, introduce them gently. You know, let them add a bunch of water, let them bring the proof down, let them have food with it. You know, give it give it time. You know, nobody jumps into the deep end of the pool. So as we're we're bringing new people on board into bourbon enthusiasm. Uh, let it let it be gentle. I can tell you firsthand, I made that mistake a couple weeks ago. A friend came in town, and I took him down to Bardstown. We toured the distilleries, and then he he likes bourbon, but he drinks it with bourbon and ginger. I'm like, oh, you gotta get past that <laughs> crap. <laughs> so I'm like, we're over here, you know, we got some of the best bourbons ever, and he's like, man, I I, I just can't get it, yep. you know, I just don't get it. And I'm it like, takes a while. I probably rushed it. So <laughs> maybe, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I guess uh, another question I want I want to pose to you. Maybe it's, uh, I, I have two. Um, one, you know, you're gonna you have a lot of tastings, and then people leave and they, they leave with a better appreciation of what it is. Now, what do you tell them? Or like, what are the first like two to three bottles that you need to go out and buy and be able to taste side by side to be able to really notice the differences in either column still versus pot still, or this kind of high rye versus uh you know a weeded. low weeded oh, like wow. whatever. So like, what do what do you what do you kind of like? What do you what's like? What's a good way to kind of tell people this that are really getting into this? Like, you want to you want to figure out and understand the nuances between different types of radically different flavor profiles. Like, how what are those bottles that you you go and tell them to choose? Well, that's a great question. Um, I always try to recommend big, easy to find products. So if we're looking at a weeded bourbon, I just go to Maker's Mark. You know, it's a top selling product. It's available most places in the world. Um, if I'm going to be looking at rye, um, there's no reason not to look at, you know, Evan Williams 
also huge seller. Um, most people are going to be able to find it. So from my perspective, you know, I, as much as we could go really deep and we could go into specific releases and specific vintages and limited editions and, and get, you know, go, go down a lot of different rabbit holes with it. Um, I, I always try to get people to start with whatever they can find, wherever they are in the world. Um, whatever bottles are on the shelf and then just go on the internet and look like it's really easy now to look up grain recipes look up distillation techniques look up ages and just have that in front of you pick whatever two three bottles you've got in your cabinet pour them side by side look up the differences um one thing that that i do recommend doing is at the, especially at the beginning is eliminating a proof difference like if you can you look up the formulas online get yourself some purified water bring everything down to 80 um so you can so because the proof difference is huge and it's a very confusing difference for people who aren't used to drinking high proof spirits. Um, but once you've eliminated that, whatever you've got, whatever you can get access to at the beginning, when you're still learning, you know, there's no reason to jump in the deep end. Right. What's the most common question people ask you when you host a tasting? Oh, they always ask me what my favorite is and oh, I just can't, the worst? I just uh, can't do it. I mean, there's so many amazing, I mean, we live in the golden age of bourbon. There's so many amazing products. Once you can get into it, once you can start tasting the different flavor profiles, once you understand wheat versus rye and, and column differences and what people were thinking and different batching techniques, it, it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Tim, I want to say thank you again for coming on the show thank today. You. This yeah. was uh, this was great kicking off our, our oh, newbies yeah. month. Uh, so I want to give you a chance to be able to plug your website, how yeah. to get in contact with you and everything like that. Uh, if you want to reach me, my website is distilled-living.com. My email address is just my first name on the front of that. So Tim at distilled-living.com. And I am Distilled Living on almost all the socials. So reach out to me there. On my website, I have a list of upcoming events. You can see where I'm going to be uh, leading tastings. And uh, if you'd like to hire me for a private function, you can do so that way too. There you go. 1-800-TIM-MIDDLE. That's right. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate you coming on. I, if it wasn't Tuesday at one o'clock, I would say I would be super excited to do a tasting note <laughs> party with you. Hey, next time I'm up in Louisville, we're going to do it. We'll do a, a full on pallet training tasting. We'll do yeah, it right. Uh, sounds, sounds great. I'm in. Yeah, let's do it. No, that, that, that was super informative and it kind of got me pumped up about bourbon again. So I'm ready to go try some more. <laughs> but no, uh, appreciate the time. I know it's a long journey for you and, and uh, I'm sure the guests will love this too. Yeah. Right. Again, thank you again. Uh, if you want to make sure you like what you hear, uh, subscribe to us on Patreon. You know, help support the show. That's p a t r e o n dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Follow us on all those great social media channels as well at Bourbon Pursuit. And uh, we're gonna have a, a steady new stream of a uh, few podcasts coming at you with all kinds of introductions back into bourbon, bourbon basics. So uh, get ready for uh, a good month coming up. So I guess uh, that's it. We'll see you all yep. next see week. You next time.